Nowadays, thanks to our huge network of highways and railroads and air routes, we can go almost anywhere we like in Canada and the rest of North America. But when the first Europeans came here, there were no roads, railway lines or airplanes. This is why most of them were confined for a long time to the eastern fringes of this continent. They couldn't penetrate any farther inland because the way was blocked, either by dense forests or by enormous mountain ranges. So, to begin with, the Europeans were locked out from the interior of North America. But there's one natural route that leads deep into the heart of the continent, which was to be the key to Canada, as well as to most of the inland areas of the United States. What is this route, and who found it? The discovery of the passageway that was to open up North America to the Europeans can ultimately be traced back to a meeting which took place here, at the ancient island monastery of Mont Saint-Michel, just off the coast of Brittany in France. It was the year 1532. The King of France, Francis I, was on a pilgrimage to this holy place, and the abbot of Mont Saint-Michel introduced him to a man by the name of Jacques Cartier, a master mariner from the nearby port of saint Malo. The upshot of this historic meeting was a royal commission for Cartier to discover certain isles where it is said there must be great quantities of gold and other riches, and also to seek access to the Asian Sea through the Strait of the Bay of Cassels. In effect, the king was asking Cartier to carry on where another of his navigators, Giovanni Verrazzano, had left off some years before. Although Verrazzano had been the first European to establish the existence of the North American continent, which had from then on been labeled on most maps as New France, he had failed to locate an opening anywhere on the coastline which might lead to Asia. But in the meantime, Frenchmen traveling to the Newfoundland fishing grounds had become familiar with the stretch of water between Newfoundland and Labrador, which we now know as the Strait of Belle Isle, and which they used to call the Strait of the Bay of Castles. So in 1534, Jacques Cartier set sail for the New World, and on this first voyage, he quickly reached the Strait of Belle Isle, from there, he traveled down the west coast of Newfoundland, then across to what is now Prince Edward Island, then the Gaspé Peninsula. Finally, he sailed round most of the island of Anticosti, before returning home back through the Strait of Belle Isle. He hadn't yet found a way through the North American continent to Asia, but he had become the first European to make a systematic exploration of the waters west of Newfoundland. The king was pleased enough with Cartier's first efforts to sponsor a second voyage the following year. This time, Cartier was much more successful. He managed to find the entrance to the river that we now call the St. Lawrence, and to sail it up to where Quebec City now stands, and then as far west as the site of present-day Montreal. This was Cartier's greatest achievement because the St. Lawrence eventually leads to the Great Lakes, which open the way not only to the north and west of Canada, but also to the south, into what is now the United States, via the Mississippi, all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. Jacques Cartier had discovered the key to Canada and to the heartland of the entire North American continent, the St. Lawrence River. When we say that Jacques Cartier discovered the St. Lawrence, or uh, Giovanni Caboto discovered Newfoundland, we should always bear in mind that this is speaking from a strictly European point of view. What these and other European explorers came across in the Americas was new to them, but of course it wasn't new to the native peoples. In fact, if it hadn't been for the original inhabitants of the region, Jacques Cartier might never have found the St. Lawrence at all. What contacts did Cartier have for the native peoples? And how did they help him? In 
To get an idea of the dealings that Cartier had with the Indians, we must try to relive some of the highlights of his first two voyages. Beginning with the Strait of Belle Isle, north of Newfoundland, then skirting the rocky southern coast of Labrador, which Cartier found so unattractive that he described it as the land God gave to Cain. But when he sighted the green and fertile landscape of Prince Edward Island, he was much more favorably impressed. He then moved on to the Gaspe Peninsula, where he had his first close encounter with native peoples, when a large number of Micmac Indians approached his ships in canoes. Cartier's next meeting with native peoples occurred further up the Gaspe coast in what is now Gaspe Harbor. Here, he met several hundred Iroquoian Indians who had come from their village at Stadacona, present-day Quebec City, in order to fish along the Gaspe Peninsula. It was here at Gaspe that Cartier was to set up a huge cross with the coat of arms of Francis I on it, three fleur-de-lis, plus the inscription, Vive le Roi de France, Long Live the King of France. The chief of the Stadacona Iroquoians, Donnacona, was not amused by this apparent claim on his territory. However, Cartier managed to satisfy Donnacona's concerns by pretending that the cross was merely a beacon to help guide future ships along the Gaspe coast. Cartier also succeeded in persuading Donnacona to let him take two of the chief's teenage sons or nephews back to France with him. Back at his farm in Saint-Malo in Brittany, Cartier had the two Iroquoians taught French in the hope that they would tell him how to find the passageway to Asia on his second voyage to the New World. And in 1535, this is exactly what the two Indians did. They led Cartier straight to the mouth of the St. Lawrence River. They then guided him as far as their hometown of Stadacona, where Quebec City is today. Later, Cartier made his way further upriver to a larger Iroquoian town called Hochelaga, where he was given a warm welcome by over a thousand Iroquoians. He then climbed the mountain near this settlement and named it the Royal Mountain, or Mont Royal, which of course has now become Montreal. Cartier had traveled over 1,500 kilometers through the St. Lawrence Valley into the interior of North America, the first white man to do so. But strictly speaking, of course, it wasn't Jacques Cartier who discovered the St. Lawrence. It was the native peoples who'd been using it for a thousand years or more. Just as it was the native peoples who originated the name Canada itself. Because when Cartier and his Indian guides first entered the St. Lawrence River, they told him that this was the great river of Hochelaga, the way to Kanata. Now, Kanata is the Iroquoian word for village or settlement. And it seems that the Indians were referring to their own Kanata of Stadacona. But Cartier misunderstood. He assumed that Kanata, or Canada as he pronounced it, was the name of the whole region. Because of this error, the word Canada soon started to appear on French maps of North America, making Jacques Cartier famous not only as the first European to sail up the St. Lawrence, but also as the man who, quite literally, put Canada on the map. So the word Canada 
first entered the European vocabulary in the year 1535 during Jacques Cartier's second voyage to North America. Although it originally only applied to a region not much bigger than Quebec City and its suburbs today. It was the native peoples who gave Cartier this Iroquoian word, Canada, just as they gave him the key to Canada in the larger sense when they guided him to the St. Lawrence River. But finding the route that eventually leads into the heart of North America wasn't the end of Cartier's exploits. Almost immediately, he was faced with another challenge. And again, it was the Indians who were to play a crucial role in what happened. What was this challenge? And how were the native peoples involved? The next hurdle that Jacques Cartier had to overcome is all too familiar to us, the Canadian winter. The winters of the early 1500s were even more severe because this was the beginning of the period known as the Little Ice Age, when temperatures were several degrees lower than they are today. By the time Cartier returned from Hochelaga, or Montreal, to the country of Canada, the Stadacona, Quebec City area, the cold weather was already setting in and the St. Lawrence was starting to freeze over. The native Canadians had had thousands of years in which to get used to these frigid conditions, but Cartier and his men were totally unprepared for the harsh Canadian climate. They suffered miserably as they huddled down in their ships, which were soon locked frozen into three meters of solid ice and snow. The Frenchmen were not only victims of inadequate shelter, they were also victims of inadequate food. They had no fresh fruit or vegetables, and very little fresh meat. In other words, no vitamin C. And without vitamin C, the blood vessels break down, resulting in the fatal disease scurvy. By February of the following year, all but 10 of the 110 Frenchmen at Stadacona were afflicted with scurvy, and 25 of them had already died. Then the Iroquoians came to the rescue. They showed Cartier and his men how to make a potion by boiling the branches of the white cedar tree. Within a very short time, they were all cured, as if by magic. We now know that the only magic involved was the fact that the white cedar is very rich in vitamin C. So, thanks to this Indian medicine, most members of the Karche expedition managed to survive the winter. But this also gave Cartier lots of time to talk to the Stadacona chief, Donacona, through the two Indian interpreters he had trained, and to ask him if there were any stores of gold or precious stones in the region similar to the treasures that he knew the Spanish were finding down in Mexico and Peru. Since Donacona very much wanted the Frenchman on his side, to help him in his periodic feuds with other Indian tribes in the area, he told Cartier the legend of the Kingdom of Saguenay. Saguenay is an Indian word, meaning the place where the waters overflow. According to this legend, the Saguenay Kingdom lay somewhere to the northwest of the St. Lawrence River and contained immense quantities of gold, rubies, and other rich things. At various times, the St. Lawrence Iroquoians had identified two Canadian rivers as the routes leading to the Kingdom of Saguenay, the river which is to this day known as the Saguenay and the Ottawa River. This suggests that perhaps there may well have been a kernel of truth to the Saguenay legend, because these two rivers and their tributaries ultimately lead all the way to the upper Great Lakes. This could have been the region the Iroquoians meant by Saguenay, the place where the waters overflow. The Ottawa and the Saguenay rivers 
were also the main routes by which Indian traders transported the copper of the Great Lakes region to the St. Lawrence. Since this was the only metal the Iroquoians knew of, copper may well have come across as gold in translation. At all events, Cartier was so entranced by this Saguenay myth that when spring came, he kidnapped Donnacona and some of his entourage and took them back to France. His plan was to get the Indian chief to tell his stories to Francis I so that the king would agree to finance a substantial French colony in Canada as a base for launching a systematic search for the treasures of Saguenay. Although Jacques Cartier and his men managed to survive one winter in Canada with the help of the Iroquoians, at this stage they had no intention of setting up house permanently. However, as the Saguenay legend grew, it was to inspire France to make a serious attempt at colonizing Canada. But establishing a colony is rather like trying to transplant a tree. It can be a delicate and risky business. The tree may very well not take in the new environment. The native peoples had had many thousands of years in which to put down their roots in the Americas. Now the French were going to make a first attempt at grafting their way of life onto a new continent. How did this work out? What happened to the first official French colony in North America? When Jacques Cartier returned to France in 1535, after his second voyage to Canada, he immediately started lobbying Francis I for his official support in setting up a colony in the St. Lawrence Valley as a launching pad for further expeditions in search of the riches of Saguenay. As he had hoped, Donnacona and the other Iroquoians that Cartier had kidnapped in Canada were a great help to him in winning over the king. The Indians were so eager to return to their native land, they were willing to say whatever the French wanted to hear. So they spun even more elaborate tales to the king of the wonders of Saguenay. Eventually, this convinced Francis I that the time had come for him to do some empire building of his own in the New World. But this was a period when France was still intermittently involved in wars with Spain, and when the newly discovered lands were still supposedly divided up between Spain and Portugal according to the line that had been drawn by the Pope in the early 1490s. With the exception of her interests in Brazil, Portugal was now out of the running for control of the Americas. But although the Spanish king had been willing to live with the North American explorations of Verrazzano and Cartier, he now objected strongly to the French king's plan to set up a colony in Canada. Fortunately, the current pope was more sympathetic to France than his predecessors had been. And Francis I was able to dismiss Spain's objections with the words, the sun shines for me as it does for others. And I would like very much to see Adam's will, to learn how he divided up the world. In 1541, the king appointed a French nobleman by the name of Roberval as the viceroy of a new colony to be established on the St. Lawrence, while Cartier was put in charge of the voyage itself. But because Roberval was delayed in his preparation for the voyage, Cartier was sent on ahead. Neither Donnacona nor any of the other Iroquoians Cartier had kidnapped nearly five years earlier were on board. All but one of them had died, victims of European diseases they had picked up in France. On arriving back in Canada, Cartier told the Stadaconans that Donnacona and the others were so happy in France they didn't want to come home. But it's unlikely that the Indians believed him. And very soon, Cartier's relations with the native peoples began to deteriorate. The Iroquoians' distrust of the French contingent was reinforced when Cartier's men, without asking the Indians' permission, 
moved to a site a few kilometers west of Stadacona, known as Cap Rouge, and began to construct two forts, one down by the river and one on top of the cliff. This was the first European settlement anywhere in North America, north of Florida, since the Vikings at Lanso Meadows and the Portuguese on Cape Breton Island. But it didn't last long. That winter, the Iroquoians took their revenge. They besieged the settlement and killed about 35 of the colonists. The following spring, Cartier and all the survivors of this attack abandoned their colony and returned to France. But the French were to make one more attempt at setting down their roots by the St. Lawrence. A few months later, Roberval and a second party of about 150 settlers arrived at Cap Rouge and rebuilt the abandoned settlement. However, that winter, disaster struck again. This time, it wasn't the Iroquoians that attacked them. It was scurvy. Roberval settlers hadn't had a chance to learn from Cartier's experience of using the juice of the white cedar as a remedy. And more than a third of them perished. It was now the turn of Roberval's party to give up in despair and sail home to France. The first French colony in Canada had failed and soon all trace of it would disappear. After the failure of Cartier and Roberval's settlement on the St. Lawrence in 1543, there was to be a long interval of over 50 years before the French would try to establish another colony on Canadian soil. But the French didn't give up their dream of reaching the fabulous kingdom of Saguenay simply because of the hostility of the Iroquois or the hazards of the Canadian winter. There were other reasons why France lost interest in colonizing Canada for over half a century. What were these reasons? We can get a clue to why there was no follow-up to the first French colony in Canada if we take a look at some of the natural features of the St. Lawrence Valley itself. Although the St. Lawrence was indeed the key to Canada, in the early days of the history of this country, you could only go so far along the river before you found your way blocked, just west of Montreal, by treacherous rapids. These cataracts, where the water level drops by as much as 15 meters, were later to become known as the Lachine Rapids, which means the China Rapids, an ironic reference since the one place to which they do not lead is China. But as far as both the Cartier and Roberval expeditions were concerned, this was the barrier which prevented them from reaching the Kingdom of Saguenay. The Iroquois had also shown Cartier that beyond the Lachine Rapids, there were more waterfalls to be negotiated but it would be much later before French explorers were to learn from the native peoples how to portage around these rapids using Indian canoes and be able to proceed up the Ottawa and St. Lawrence rivers and thence to the Great Lakes, the region that is believed to correspond to the Kingdom of Saguenay. But Cartier and then Roberval tried to master the Lachine Rapids in their longboats and failed miserably in the attempt. So they had to give up any hope of reaching the gold and rubies of Saguenay. They'd come to a dead end. This is what forced Cartier to realize that if he wanted to take any Canadian treasure back to France, he'd better start looking for it on the banks of the St. Lawrence itself. First, 
It seemed he had hit the jackpot because it so happens that the cliffs at Cap Rouge, where Cartier built his settlement in 1541, contain two particular types of mineral, iron pyrites, which looks like gold, and quartz crystals, which look like diamonds. Cartier was completely taken in by the minerals he found here and took them back in triumph to France. Of course, as soon as the experts back home analyzed these treasures, they were exposed as quite worthless chunks of rock. This was the last straw. Canada really seemed to be a dead loss. Trouble with the native peoples? Terrible winters. Impassable rapids. And now the fiasco of fool's gold and fake diamonds. No wonder the French rulers were to wash their hands of Canada for the next 50 years. The very word Canada became synonymous with foolishness, summed up in a new proverb which was to go the rounds of Europe. Faux con diamant de Canada, as false as Canada diamonds. There was obviously nothing here to compare with the wealth the Spanish had hit upon in Central and South America. But there is a final irony to all this. Canada is now the world's third largest producer of gold, with much greater reserves of this precious metal than were ever found in Mexico or Peru. And the deepest gold mine in all of North America is at Kirkland Lake, near the headwaters of the Ottawa River. Perhaps the kingdom of Saguenay wasn't such a myth after all. <laughs>